Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis on this 21st day of March 2019. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed action-filled information overload. And once again, we can stress the overload. Uh, we're going to start today actually by talking about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. I just actually finished reading this book by James Watson. He was one of the uh, two people who had discovered the double helix um, of uh, DNA as the secret to life. Uh, received the Nobel Prize uh, in, I think, chemistry back in 1962. And uh, he and Francis Crick had discovered uh, the double helix strand back in 1953. And it's a very, very fascinating topic. And with all these ancestry genealogical DNA kits going out, it all comes back to the double helix. And uh, same thing with forensic anthropology. And, uh, and if you've watched this show for any great length of time, we've done a lot of, of discussion over the years about the USS Oklahoma from Pearl Harbor, how they're using DNA to uh, re identify remains from that vessel uh, previously were unidentified. Uh, I, I knew the brother of uh, one of the deceased and was at his funeral last year. So I guess DNA has turned out more important in our life as far as, you know, of course it's the life-giving thing, but it, it's turned out to have a lot more useful purposes than uh, anybody I think had realized, well, maybe Watson knew. Um, you know, I first read Watson's book, The Double Helix, back as a young undergraduate student back around 1990, and it's amazing to see how many advancements that have been made since then. So speaking of DNA and genealogy, well, I had my autosomal DNA tested by Ancestry, and I'm going to show you my results. if my producer can find it. There we go. And there is my ethnicity estimate. And if you ever notice that I uh, ever talk about Finland and Santa Claus and Lapland and reindeer and the North Pole, that's because I'm 45% Finnish. I'm also 24% Swedish, 17% from England, Wales, and Northwestern Europe, 10% uh, from Ireland and Scotland, 2% from Norway, 1% from uh, France, and 1% of European Jew. Northern Euro Mutt. <laughs> Northern Euro Mutt is uh, what my uh, producer says. So now the challenge for Dallas is that he's got to have his test and we can compare results someday. And he's shaking his head saying, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Mostly Welsh. Oh, he says he's mostly Welsh. Well, I mean, 17% of me agrees with him then. So I think we're uh, good on that front. Dallas and I work very, very well together. But uh, I wanted to point this out because uh, this is the autosomal DNA. And what that means is this is a comparison of the DNA on the, uh, not the Y or the X chromosomes. This is all the uh, match on the other chromosomes. Uh, so why is this important? Well, it's actually important because of a forensic case that actually had uh, just broken open uh, just this past week. As a matter of fact, last Thursday when we had taped this show, something very important um, to a certain family here in Stillwater uh, really made the news. And uh, we're going to show you right now is a 34-year-old case has been solved because of DNA. A man accused of killing a Navy recruit 34 years ago now has the chance to get out of jail. In the last couple of hours, in fact, a judge granted a $250,000 bond to Thomas Garner. Yesterday, deputies announced his arrest on first-degree murder charges. Channel 9's Johnny Fernandez was in that court hearing today. And, Johnny, there are conditions, though, to that suspect's bond. Yeah, and the judge did say that he did find a probable cause in this case, but that Gardner will have some restrictions, including uh, not being able to leave the state, wearing a GPS monitor, and also not talking to witnesses in this case. Now, I want to get over to some video and show you what Thomas Gardner looked like when he uh, appeared before a judge. Now, we do know that the Seminole County Sheriff says that genealogy testing led them to Gardner as a suspect in the case of Pamela Kahanes. Now, she was killed 34 years ago. Both were in the Navy and living on base at the time of the 
the death. Today, the state argued no bond for Garner due to him being a possible threat to the community and this once cold case now being a capital felony. The public defender argued Garner has lived a crime-free life. Now take a listen to what the judge said after hearing both sides. I'm going to give him a bond. I do not find that he is a threat to the community from what I can see. He has a single event, a particularly egregious event, but there is a presumption that people are entitled to bond while they're awaiting trial. Now, we do know that Garner will appear in court again for an arraignment uh, on April 30th at 1.30 in the afternoon. Reporting here in Seminole County, I'm Johnny Fernandez, Channel 9 Eyewitness News. Now, why this is important in our area is the fact that Kahanis, Kah Kahanis, she grew up on a dairy farm in Baytown Township, not too far from the studio where we're taping this from. Uh, she graduated from Stillwater High School in 1976 and was 25 at the time of her death. And the detectives used a genetic genealogical research to develop a DNA family tree. Uh, I don't know if they went with any of the companies like Ancestry, 23andMe, or uh, Family Tree uh, DNA. I don't know exactly how they did that, but they were able to use DNA to figure out who the main suspect was, and that led to the uh, arrest of Garner. So now we're going to take a look at the family's reaction to having this mystery of the death of their loved one solved. Pamela Kahanis grew up the second youngest of eight siblings in a big farm family outside Stillwater. But in the summer of 1984, the 25-year-old wanted to see more of the world. And she thought by joining the Navy, she would possibly be able to do this. Kahanis made it through two months of boot camp in Florida. Then came August 5th. A driver found her body in the lawn of an empty house, a half hour north of the training base in Orlando. Her brothers and sisters spent the next 34 years in agony. And many times I would think, you know, okay, if I say a prayer and I lay here still tonight, I'll be directed to what happened to her, and it just never comes. 20 years went by, 30 years go by, I didn't think they'd solve it. Now police believe they have. The state of Florida is entitled to see a judge. Thomas Garner walked into a Florida courtroom on Thursday, charged with first-degree murder after 34 years. Police haven't given a motive, but they say Garner worked at the Naval Training Center with Kahanis. Police found him by tracing his DNA through a public genealogy database. I hope she's looking down saying, good, got him, good. I, I, great day, great day. On a billboard outside the family business, murder solved. The family had never heard the name Thomas Garner. Police say he's been living in Jacksonville all these years, working as a dental hygienist. We haven't had her for 34 years. So for him, 34 years without something would be great for me. I just figured she wouldn't lay at rest until we caught the one that did it. And I'm so happy that came today. The family here in Minnesota learned all of this today in person. A detective hopped on a flight from Florida to personally deliver the news of the arrest just an hour before it went public. Back to you. All right, thank you. Dave. So again, I'm just glad to know that a family finally has peace, and that shows that DNA actually is valuable. Now, of course, if you happen to be a criminal who has done something egregious, I would not recommend taking a DNA test. Um, but, you know, those cases, um, you know, they're few and far between, I think. And, or in this case, a family member. Or in this case, a family member. But, uh, again, it all goes back down to the fact that I'm glad to see that a family in this area, in this viewing audience, has been able to get, you know, peace. Now, we're going to show just a little bit here as to the science behind DNA fingerprinting. Uh, I guess you hear this stuff, but what really is it you know how do they do this and we're we're always n we're never content with trying to give you a superficial look just at the top that's what all the other news channels do we want to dig a little bit deeper but not to the point where I'm going to give you every paragraph out of this book we're not going to go that deep uh, actually he writes one whole chapter about DNA fingerprinting we're only going to give you just a little bit of a synopsis but deeper than you're going to see with most other places so let's take a look at the science behind DNA fingerprinting
Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about DNA fingerprinting. We sometimes refer to this as DNA profiling or your genetic fingerprint. And basically, it started with this guy, Alec Jeffries. Basically, in his lab, he was working with x-ray and looking at um, DNA. And what he figured out is he could tell a lot about a person by their looking at their DNA, quote-unquote, fingerprint. In other words, he could see who they were related to or who they weren't. Um, he could tell paternity, for example. And so he was working at the University of, University of Leicester and basically figured out this whole idea of DNA fingerprinting. This is around 1984. And basically for the next three years, all DNA fingerprinting on the planet went through this university. And so eventually it was privatized and this is everywhere. And it'll probably eventually be replaced by just DNA sequencing, sequencing all the letters in DNA. But to make it understandable, essentially what we have in a human is we have long linear segments of, of DNA, but within that we have these genes. And so 99.9% .9 of our DNA in everyone is going to be exactly the same. The genes are going to be the same, but you're, again, you're going to have different copies or alleles of those genes. That's what makes you you. But if we look into this area in the middle, we used to call this junk DNA, but now we know it's really important in controlling gene expression we find that there's quite a bit of variability in here, which shouldn't surprise us because this, the gene, makes the protein and the protein makes the phenotype and that's really what natural selection is selecting for or against. But this in the middle can go crazy and so it does. And so an example of one that we use in DNA fingerprinting is something called short tandem repeats. Uh, originally we started with something called VNTR, variable number tandem repeats, and you'll find in DNA sequencing that you have all kinds of, so we had STRs, we have VNTRs, before that we had restriction, fragment length, uh, polymorphisms, and so there's a bunch of different things that we could look at, but we're kind of moved to this idea of these short tandem repeats, they work great, there's quite a bit of variability in individuals. And so what is it? You basically have letters of DNA that repeat over and 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 over. So sometimes, you know, 50 times it repeats. And so what does that look like? Well, if we have these three individuals, we'll call this Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, and then Mr. Mustache. And so if we look at these three people, their genes are going to be the same. But these STRs are going to be different. These single or short tandem repeats are going to be different. You can see that... Mr. Blonde has more than Mr. Mustache and less than uh, Mrs. Red. And so if I make that a little bit easier to, to grasp onto, if I count them out, and then remove everything else, what we get is variability between all individuals. Everything else was the same, but we see variability in here. Um, and we can cut these sections out using restriction enzymes, and then we can amplify them using polymerase chain reaction, and then we can separate them using gel electrophoresis. So how does that work? Basically, I'll take the DNA and I'll put them in a little well, and so we're looking down on this, and so this is an agarose gel. I could put Mrs. Red's and then Mr. Mustache. I could put those all in DNA. Basically, I would then turn on the voltage. So there's going to be a positive charge here, negative charge up here. DNA is a negative charge, and so it's going to be pulled towards the positive. And so what's going to happen is those little fragments of DNA are going to migrate. And so what does that allow me to do? It, t it allows me to tell the difference between each of these individuals. And so this is their fingerprint. But you can tell that this is a really bad fingerprint because we've got some... These two are exactly the same here, and so... In, when they really do DNA profiling, what they do is they generally use 13 different sections like this. And then those 13 sections are each going to be highly variable. And so it's a good way to tell who's who. When would we ever want to do this? Forensics is one reason. And then also in maternity, figuring out who's dad. And so let's talk about the murder. There was a murder that was committed. Somebody was brutally murdered by one of these three suspects. So Mr. Blonde, Mrs. Red, or Mr. Mustache. But they left blood at the scene. And so what I can do is I can grab samples of DNA from each of our um, suspects, and then I could grab the blood itself, and then I could do DNA fingerprinting on them. So before we separate them, you may think to yourself, which of these looks guilty? Who looks like they're capable of murder? And if we separate them then using that gel, what we can see is that Mr. Blonde is guilty. In other words, his blood matches up with the crime scene. And so how, what do I mean by matching up? Well, those single or those short tandem repeats, if we look vert horizontally, are going to be exactly lined up. 
And if we were to look at Mr. Blonde's son, we'd find more similarities than we would between the others. And so basically that's DNA profiling, DNA fingerprinting. It's much more sophisticated than that, but again, it's kind of on its way out. We'll eventually replace this with DNA sequencing. In the U.S., we, um, the FBI has started creating this database of DNA, which is a little scary. And basically what they use are 13 different areas within the chromosome or the genome, and then they're looking at those short tandem repeats in there. Um, now, why do I say that's a little bit scary? I think you really want to protect your DNA because as we learn more and more about genetics, what's going to be found in your DNA? Well, predisposition to Alzheimer's or breast cancer, any of these things, which your insurance company would love to get a hold of. And so, um, and it also doesn't answer the idea of Mr. Blonde, did he really do it? I mean, did the police frame him and then contaminate the blood? Um, so we don't know that. All it does tell us is if we have two samples of DNA, the odds of two people having the same DNA fingerprint are astronomical, unless they're identical, but I digress. And I hope that's helpful. We so there you have it. That's just a little bit more into the insights of how the DNA testing works as far as the DNA fingerprint. Uh, that I just felt that you should have a little bit more knowledge. I mean, especially as we hear more and more cases of cold cases from 10, 20, 30 years ago being solved, there's a little bit more into the science as to how that's done. Now we are going to move on and do a little bit of a pivot, but we're going to kind of keep to a related topic because we haven't done a Prager University segment today. And so we are going to go right to that now on why Obamacare doesn't work as promised. We will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. We weren't as clear as we needed to be uh, in terms of the changes that were taking place. And I am sorry that they uh, you know, are finding themselves in this situation based on assurances they got from me. It's very easy for a politician to stand up before voters and say, health care is a right, and then passionately advocate for single payer or free health care or Medicare for all, whatever term they might use. But before we consider the merits of the government managing your health care, and that's what this all boils down to, maybe we should ask a more basic question. What do we mean by health care? Because if you get sick, and here we're talking major illness or you're in serious pain, you don't just want health care. You want quality health care. And where is your best chance of finding that? The answer is right here in America. For skilled doctors, cutting edge medical treatments, and care without long delays, no other country rivals the United States. Not even close. Nobody from Texas is going to Canada for medical treatment. It's almost always the other way around. Sure, our health care system has lots of issues, and we should address them. But do we really want to upend all the advantages that we do have and start from scratch? because that's what would have to happen if we completely turn health care over to the government. So let's imagine we make the change. We hear a lot about how great free health care would be, but it's only fair we look at the downside. The first is that government-run health care takes medical decisions away from patients, that means you, and puts them in the hands of bureaucrats. They decide, for example, how many MRI machines are going to be available, or under what conditions you can get back surgery or a bypass, or even whether you qualify for cancer treatment. That's how it works in the United Kingdom under its single-payer system. Because it has finite resources, the National Health Service, or NHS, sharply restricts access to treatments like hip and knee replacements, cataract surgery, and even prescription drugs to deal with common conditions like arthritis and diabetes. If you suffer from any of these ailments and many others in the UK, you may just have to live with the pain. And let's hope you don't have a medical emergency. In a January 2018 article in the New York Times, patients in emergency rooms around London are described as having to wait 12 hours before they are tended to. Corridors are jammed with beds carrying the frail and elderly. To deal with the situation, hospitals were ordered to postpone non-urgent surgeries until the end of the month. That hardly seems like an improvement over what we have in the U.S. A second big problem with single-payer systems is that they are expensive, really expensive. A recent study by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University found that a Bernie Sanders-style Medicare for All health system would cost a tidy $32.6 trillion over 10 years. 
That's on top of what the federal government spends on health care today. And this is not a new number. Other studies have found the cost to be roughly in the same range. So how would we pay for it? Kenneth Thorpe, a professor at Emory University and health policy official in the Clinton administration, spells it out. If you are going to go in this direction, Medicare for all, the tax increases are going to be enormous. Not just for the rich, Thorpe estimates, but for working Americans and the poor too. Charles Blahaus, the author of the Mercatus study, puts it this way. Even a doubling of all projected individual and corporate income taxes would be insufficient to finance these added federal costs. And he considers that a conservative estimate. Canada knows all about exploding health care costs. In Ontario, the country's biggest province, those costs took up 46% of its entire budget in 2010. By 2030, that number is projected to be 80%. In other words, in a few years, Ontario will have little money to pay for anything except health care. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, government-run systems depress the search for new cures. Biomedical research spending in the U.S. far outpaces that of any country with nationalized health care, even when you account for differences in population or size of economies. That's one reason medical breakthroughs rarely come from countries where the government controls health care. They come from the United States, where the government doesn't. The lion's share of biomedical research and development spending in the U.S., over $70 billion in 2012, comes from the private sector. Discovering new medical cures and technology is a profitable business, and thank goodness it is. Those profits drive innovation. Take away the profits, and you will surely take away the innovation. Single payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. I'm Lan He Chen, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Biomedical, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, D, uh, double helix, private investment generates the stuff. If we're going to have cures, and you know, in the book he brings in uh, uh, Down syndrome. Uh, he brings up uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, other genetic diseases. Are they going to be cured with a medical, Medicare for all system? The answer is no. Now, are they cured now? No, they're not. But there are scientists that are working on this stuff. And they're going in and looking at gene therapies. They're looking at uh, isolating uh, genes on certain chromosomes. And, and it's a huge, it's like finding a, trying to find a needle in a haystack sometimes. And it goes back to all those uh, short tandem repeats that I had shown you on the previous video. You know, this is the way our cells are structured. And so finding four uh, bases, polymerase uh, bases, you know, a whole bunch of uh, T's, A's, C's, G's, uh, all in different sequences and strands. I mean, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's just like trying to take a uh, sheet of paper and type four letters on it in a typewriter all across the page and then compare that with another one and find the anomaly. It's, it's kind of hard. I mean, you sometimes see on uh, Facebook, you know, the spot the incorrect letter. Yeah, you can do that with one letter. If everything's the same, your eyes will pick up on the anomaly right away. But if you have a string of four or five letters, and then you're trying to find another string of four or five letters that don't go in the place they should. That, that's complicated stuff, and it takes a lot of investment of time and money in order to find this stuff. And I'm only, again, giving you that little surface here. Um, we're not going to get that with a single-payer system. We're not going to get that level of interest and innovation with a government paying for everything. We're going to get that from private investment. And... So that is an important thing, just to kind of tie our, our two segments together. I'm bringing up Obamacare because of a debate that happened in the, on the floor of the State House of Representatives just yesterday. House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt is talking about the reinsurance program that uh, passed the House and Senate uh, in his current law but needs extension. And the Democrats are objecting to that. And Representative Doubt took on two members 
I, I really, he probably took on more. I only watched like the first 10 minutes. It's all I'm going to show you is just the first, first few minutes of the debate. I'm not going to show you the entire half an hour long thing because it starts getting repetitive. I'm not going to do a long tandem repeat in this, uh, in this case. I'm going to give you the exchange that he has with two members, and I think you're going to get you know, kind of um, a good wrap-up of, of where this debate is focused. This is important stuff because it inf impacts you. So please, take a good look at this next video. Representative Liebling, uh, Chair Liebling, you said something I think that was, was very dangerous here on the House floor. Uh, you actually said that, that there are people whose uh, rates and cost for health insurance went up because of reinsurance. Um, and that is not accurate. And if I am wrong, and I'll give you a chance to yield for a question, and I'm not talking about their rate from the previous year to the next year, I'm talking about their rate with reinsurance versus their rate without reinsurance. Because the way that you said it implies to people that their rates went up. And I'm going to explain to you what the law of average is right now. Because you were correct when you said that the rates on average were reduced by 20%. So that means if somebody's, if somebody's rate actually went up, as a result of reinsurance, that there's another person whose rate was lowered by 40%. That's what an average is. The average was 20% reduction. Okay? And, and I think that you, I don't think you intended to mislead people, but I think people at home listening and people in this chamber listening think that you think that somebody's rates went up because of reinsurance. And I think that's a very dangerous thing to say. Would Representative Mann yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, this is a very important issue, uh, and I happen to know because I knocked on some doors in your district, so I happen to talk to some of your constituents. Um, was the... Uh, was reducing health insurance uh, costs and reducing uh, uh, health costs, health care costs, a big issue in, with constituents in your district? Was that something very important to your constituents? The member from Dakota, Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Dowd, yes, that was a very big issue. Uh, what was not a big issue for them was us as a body giving money taxpayer money to insurance companies as a giveaway with no strings attached to say here please lower our premiums we hope that you'll do it but we don't know if you actually will or not and in fact some insurance companies didn't do that so lowering health care costs and access to care was certainly very important in my district giving away money with no strings attached to companies who are benefiting off the back of sick people in our communities was not important to them. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and, and I appreciate your passion, Representative Mann. Um, I'm not sure that has happened. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of options before us. We've got a proven one um, in reinsurance that, that has reduced rates. Um, do you know what the impact was? Uh, of, of, of rates under reinsurance. Do you know how much it reduced rates for, for Minnesotans, for your constituents, if she would yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I think we've heard many times already that the average was about 20%. And you're right, an average is an average, meaning that some people's insurance went up and others went down. So it was not something that was solid across the board, right? So if we have a program like the subsidy program where everyone will get 20% reduction, and we know that everyone will get a 20% reduction, that program is actually significantly better than just an average of 20%. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and I appreciate that for, for saying that I am right, because I am right. The average was a 20% reduction. And the, and the program worked. Uh, so I appreciate you admitting that the program worked and that I am right. Uh, so we have two options before us. We have a proven system that has reduced rates. Um, we also have uh, insurance companies now that are telling us that, that rates could increase if we don't 
renew this uh, reinsurance program that rates could increase as much as 50 percent. Um, and then we have the governor's plan, which is a, a 20 percent uh, uh, premium reduction just straight across the board. So do you, I mean, what is your plan? If you don't support the reinsurance, which I'm, I'm, I'm gathering from your comments that you don't support the reinsurance program, what is your plan? Do you support the governor's plan if she would yield? She will yield. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Dowd. I support a plan where we know that every constituent and every person who is on the individual market will get a 20% 20, 20 reduction. I absolutely support that plan. I do not support a plan where, again, we give companies who are benefiting off sick people in our communities and we tell them, do whatever you want with that, and you may or may not decrease the premiums. I don't support that. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, if she would continue to yield. She will yield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, does, so do I understand you correctly that under the governor's plan, everybody on the individual marketplace will see a 20% reduction? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That is the goal of the plan, Representative Dowd. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You are wrong. Because under the governor's plan, only people who buy their insurance through Minsure will get a 20% reduction. Other people who buy their insurance in the individual marketplace will get screwed. That's what happens under the governor's plan. So I, I heard you, I want to ask if I heard you correctly as well, that you don't support a plan that gives checks to insurance companies, that just gives checks to insurance companies, if she would yield for a question. I would like to remind the body that it is the matter in dispute and not personalities, so that we should be referring, keeping our remarks confined to the subject matter and not individuals in the debate. Representative Mann, will you yield? She will. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Dowd, I'm not quite sure how to make this any more clear for you. Um, I do not support us giving money with no strings attached to insurance companies and saying to them, you may do with this what you will. Because that's what we did and we saw premiums go up with that plan. Some went down, some went up. So I do not support giving money, again, just so we're clear, with no strings attached directly to the insurance company. Now, I support a plan where they are paid for their services, and we know what services those are, and we know what we owe them. That's a whole nother story. That's paying for a service. Good. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Mann, under the governor's plan, they're going to hire 51 additional people to write checks to insurance companies. So I join you that I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should use the proven plan that already worked to reduce premiums for people in your district by 20 percentage points. Would Representative Christensen yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Christensen, uh, was health care costs and health insurance costs an important issue in, in your district to your constituents? The member from Washington, Representative Christensen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Absolutely, yes, they were. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and I'm glad to hear you say that because they were in mine too, and I'm sure your constituents are as happy as mine uh, that reinsurance was so effective at reducing their rates. Uh, do, you, do you agree with uh, uh, presidential candidate Amy Klobuchar uh, when she said that it was, uh, that when she praised reinsurance and said that it was so great and should be passed on the national level? Would you agree with her if she would yield? The measure before the body is the David's motion on suspension of the rules to take up reinsurance immediately. Representative Christensen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Dowd. I agree with um, Representative Mann, and I agree with um, what she stands for today. That's where I stand. Thank you. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, members, this is something that we can't wait on. That's why we have a motion before the body 
uh, to put this on the general register. By the way, the motion isn't to bring it up for immediate consideration. It's just to move it to the general register. Because we have committee chairs that won't even move the bill out of their committee. And, and what's the alternative? An unproven plan by the governor that, by the way, was introduced on March 11th that hasn't had a hearing in this body yet. And, and if Representative Christian said we yield for another question. She will yield. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Christensen, I don't know, I guess, if you sit on these committees uh, that, that heard this last night, um, but are you aware that uh, Commissioner Kelly actually said that rates would be higher under the governor's plan than they would be under reinsurance? Are you aware he said that in committee last night? Representative Christensen. Madam Speaker, Representative Doubt. No, I'm not, I do not sit on those committees. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If she would yield for one more. Uh, uh, are, do your constituents want higher rates? Is that what they want? Do they want their, their health insurance rates to go up, if she would yield? Representative Christensen. No, they don't. And the reason I was elected in my district is because I stand for um, Representative Mann's plan. Thank you. Representative Doubt. I, we need to have some hearings. <laughs> we need to have some hearings on these bills, members. We need to have some discussion and debate here on the House floor about these bills. Because you are standing here telling me that you support something that will increase rates for your constituents. And you were on the campaign trail telling your constituents that you wanted lower rates. That's why this motion is important. You don't understand what we're doing here. The commissioner in committee last night said that the rates would be higher under the governor's plan. Under the governor's plan, they want to hire 51 people to write checks to insurance companies. And they want to create a whole new system over at Minute to administer this. I appreciate uh, former Chair David's uh, confidence that that would go off without a hitch. Uh, but based on the record of, of Minute and Minsure, I would rather stick with something that's proven, not with something that's almost guaranteed to fail. And we know from the commissioner that is guaranteed to increase rates for our, for our constituents. I bet if I could say in this chamber, how many of you campaigned on, on lowering health care costs and rates for your constituents, every single hand in this chamber would go up. But when I ask you to compare this, which has a proven track record, reinsurance, a proven track record of lowering rates for Minnesotans, 20% on average. By the way, you cannot say that a single person's rates went up as a result of, of reinsurance. You can say that somebody paid more under reinsurance, but it's not as a result of reinsurance. And there's a big distinction there. And I believe that you misled people when you said that in this chamber, Chair Liebling. But I appreciate you correcting the record when you said on average rates went down 20%. So some people less than 20% and some people a lot more than 20%. I assume because the insurance companies kept their word and they reduced the rates when we, when we passed that program, that you also understand when they say rates could go up as much as 50% if we don't reauthorize the program, that we would take them at their word. And what's your plan? Increase rates 50% and then lower them 20%. That sound like a winning equation for Minnesotans? Because that's the governor's plan. Increase rates 50% and then lower them 20%. Sounds like political speak to me. We can't sit on our hands in this chamber any longer. Minnesotans can't afford the higher rates that you are going to force on them if you pass the governor's plan. That's not my opinion. That's the governor's commissioner last night in committee when he said that rates would go up under the governor's plan over what they would be under reinsurance, that they would be higher under the governor's plan. Those aren't my words. That's the governor's own commissioner. But we're going to lock these bills up in committee and not give them hearings. The governor's plan hasn't even had a hearing yet. 
and it sounds like that's what you support. I can't wait till it gets a hearing so you can learn all the stuff that I have learned because I've dug into it. If you don't support giving checks to insurance companies, you certainly won't support the governor's plan. 51 additional people just to write checks. How many checks need to be written that we need 51 people to write them? Checks to insurance companies. To increase rates for Minnesotans. Sounds like a great plan. It kind of reminds me of the governor's uh, gas tax plan, where only half the money goes to roads and bridges. The other half goes for fraud, waste, and abuse at DHS. Guys, we're actually doing things to try to help Minnesotans here. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy to be in the majority. Not everybody on my side of the aisle supported reinsurance or thought that it was going to be a great thing when we passed it. You know what? It turned out that it worked really, really well. And it became a national model. And even people like Amy Klobuchar now think that it was so successful it should be passed at the national level. We saved the individual marketplace. Now, of course, we have rules here that I could never question your motives. But I will tell you, at times, I've wondered if Minsure wasn't designed to destroy the individual marketplace on purpose so that we could move to a government-run health care system. That, that thought crossed my mind. And you know why? Because sometimes I think about it and I try, to, I try to reverse engineer it in my head. Instead of just, you know, sometimes we come up with a solution here in this chamber or in this body. And, and through the process, you know, if, if you weren't involved in the process, because I don't sit on those committees, I look back and I say, if I actually wanted to design a system to destroy the individual marketplace, could I have, de could I have designed something that would have worked better than Minsure to destroy the individual marketplace? I'm not sure I could have. I'm not sure I could have. So I don't question anybody's motives in this chamber. I wouldn't do that. But Minnesotans can't wait for us to sit on our hands and lock bills up in committee without giving them hearings, without talking about this issue. They're tired of politicians going out on the campaign trail and talking about wanting to lower health care costs and lower insurance rates. And then they come here and they stand up on this floor and say, that they will support a plan which will increase rates for Minnesotans. Not my words. The governor's own commissioner said that last night in committee. That's what you support? Let's get this bill out of committee. Let's get it on the general register. And let's pass it. It worked. So successfully that it's become a national model that Amy Klobuchar, Minnesota's favorite daughter, who's running for president, thinks it's such a great idea we should use it nationally. But Democrats in this chamber won't even let the bill out of committee. And they want to mislead Minnesotans into somehow thinking that this raised rates for Minnesotans. <laughs> That's laughable. That is laughable. You cannot deny the facts. And the facts are that this program was successful. And if you don't like raising rates, then you can't support the governor's plan. Because his commissioner last night told us that rates will be higher under the governor's plan than they would be under reinsurance. All right, I think uh, we've probably all had enough, but that's the debate going on down at the Capitol right now. This is the stuff that impacts you. As a matter of fact, if you're from Stillwater, uh, watching this on Valley Access TV, uh, that one of those representatives happens to be yours. So that's what's going on with an issue that impacts every single one of us who live in the state. And I don't know which side of the debate you're on. I really don't. But what I do hope 
that our politicians from both parties representing us in both the House and the Senate down at the Capitol can have our best interest in mind. And when it comes to actually wanting to reduce the cost of health insurance and actual the, hot, the cost of care, that they're down there doing just that and not just playing political games. But from what you just saw and what I just saw, it looks like they're playing a lot more political games. It's pretty sad. Anyhow, uh, in the time we have left, we're going to make yet one more pivot. Because uh, last year we covered the retail apocalypse in 2018. We even looked a little bit at the ending of 2017. Well, here we are nearing the end of the first quarter of 2019, and guess what happens? More retail is closing. And this one does impact Minnesota. It impacts Wisconsin. It impacts Upper Michigan. That is the closing of Shopco. Now, when we begin, when we you know, to introduce this, we're going to show you just a uh, throwback uh, Shopco ad. I think it was around 1979 or 1980. Back when I remember this ad when I was a kid. So we're going to we're going to show you a Shopco ad just to kind of refocus here. or too big. It really doesn't matter. What matters to us at Shopco is your satisfaction. If you want to return anything for any reason, return it. No problem. Our no-hassle return policy pays off because it makes our customers happy. And that's what Shopco wants. Happy customers coming back again and again. Say hello to a goodbye at Shopco. Now I will have to say that that kind of seems to be the golden age of retail. That was before the internet, of course, and that was before consumers had more choices. That was before Walmart expanded. Uh, so those were the glory days of retail. Now, as we've discussed before, a lot of cases, and this one is no exception, that um, let me find, I had a st story here and I'm trying to find it. Ah, yes. Shopco is owned by a hedge fund, Sun Capital from Florida. Uh, well, let's just show the next story while I find the story here. Shopco announcing today they're filing for bankruptcy after spending several months trying to improve and strengthen its financial position. NBC 26's Juliana Falk is live in Green Bay. Now, Juliana, how many stores will be closing? Regina, this Shopco here on Military Avenue is one of the 38 additional stores the retailer says will be closing. They say this is to position their company for future success. Now, the company has been around for close to 60 years with its roots right here in Green Bay. Shopco says this is a restructuring process. It will continue to operate and serve customers, vendors, partners, and employees. CEO Russ Steinhorst saying this was a difficult decision but was necessary because of debt and ongoing competitive pressure. The executive director of Bay Area Workforce Development Board, Jim Golombeski, says there are many job opportunities for employees who may be losing their jobs due to these store closures. You go back to the, the Great Recession in 2008 or the re recession we had in 2002, where there were not any opportunities. All these layoffs were happening, no jobs for anybody. That's not the situation that we're in right now. He says Job Center is listing nearly 200 jobs available between Brown County and Outagamie County. And the employees aren't the only ones that are going to be affected. Customers we spoke with today are also going to feel the impacts. They say they're already sad to see this store closing, especially knowing it's the first Shopco that was opened. Reporting live in Green Bay, Juliana Falk, NBC 26. So now that was January. That, that's that story that we just played. That aired in January. And here's, uh, there was a uh, story, and I do not know what I did with it here. Ah, yes. Uh, Shopco, this, came, this is in the Green Bay Press-Gazette. 
January 7th. Shopco could file for bankruptcy protection from creditors as soon as next week, according to a pharmaceutical drug supplier that says the retail it, uh, owes it $67 million. Uh, Jeff Garfinkel, an attorney for San Francisco-based McKesson Corporation, said during a hearing on Monday in Brown County Circuit Court that Shopco is expected to file for bankruptcy on January 15th. The companies were in court for a hearing on McKesson's request for a straining order to keep Shopco from selling medications it supplied, the eschwabanon based retailer. McKesson claims it has provided Shopco with $67 million in drugs since November 11th, but has not been paid since early December. That was kind of the beginning of the end, it seems. Um, for Shopco, they... Uh, have less than one billion dollars in assets and between one billion and ten billion dollars in liabilities. Those are with a B, not an M. Uh, so the company is buckling under its debts and it's failed to pay certain suppliers, including the one we just mentioned. Uh, and it lined up uh, debtor in possession financing of four hundred and eighty million dollars to get it through the Chapter Eleven bankruptcy process. So now in uh, February, I think this was, they announced more store closures, and this one impacts Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Well, to many shoppers is disappointment. Shopco has announced that they are closing some of their stores right here in the UP. Shopco released a statement just yesterday detailing their plans to have a smaller footprint in order to work closer with potential buyers. Shopco filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in mid-January and will now be closing over 139 stores. The locations in Marquette, Houghton, Escanaba, Launce and Calumet were a part of that list, and the store in Munising was announced earlier this year. For now, there's no new news regarding the hometown store location in Ishpeming. Shopco also added that around 50 of their optical centers, generally located within their stores, will be moving to new freestanding operations. A longtime staple of this area will soon become... Well, that was in February. So now, just what, three, four days ago, came the announcement that things have even changed for the worst. That yes... Shopco is now liquidating. That just came out earlier this week. Let's take a look at this story. People of this area will soon be coming to a close. Shopco is shutting down its remaining stores nationwide. Local 5's John Dommel live with us now in the studio with What's Next. John? Tom, Shopco could not find a buyer, and now all of its stores will be closing by the summer. It's been around since Kennedy was president, and now retail operations are winding down. One shopper that we bumped into has been coming here for 30 years. It was only stored near us when I was a kid, so we shopped at Shopco for everything except for groceries. I mean, it was all our essentials there, so it's pretty much, you know, I grew up with Shopco. The closures mean another 5,000 employees could lose their jobs, but the optical branch is still holding on with four locations staying open for now. Shopco's CEO briefly commented on the company's closing act, saying this is not the outcome that we had hoped for when we started our restructuring efforts. We want to thank all of our teammates for their hard work and dedication during their time at Shopco. I always have found a good assortment of, you know, clothing here and, you know, just, you know, the, it was always, you always had a good experience coming to the Shopco stores. They're always friendly and helpful to help you out. The last of the Shopco stores are expected to close by the middle of June. And for Bay Park Square Mall, this means yet another store closure, making Kohl's the last of the mall's anchor stores. Reporting live in the studio, John Dommel, Local 5 News. Man, I just happened to have been at that mall, uh, the, the uh, one with Kohl's, <laughs> on Christmas Eve. I was actually in Green Bay, and I was in that Shopco store. Uh, just a brief history of Shopco. I'm not going to get too, too much here because we've got only a few minutes left. Uh, 1961, Green Bay Mayor Roman Dennison and Shopco stores led by Chicago pharmacist James Rubin and a group of investors announced plan, plans for a $1 million department store on Military Avenue in Green Bay. 
And in April of 1962, the first Shopco store opened. And then in September 1969, the first Shopco store opened in Michigan, in Marquette, Michigan. And uh, starting in 1975, I've shopped at that store uh, many, many, many times. That's the area where I grew up. Uh, 1970s, uh, uh, Rubin announced plans for corporate headquarters in Ashwaubenon, and then the same month becomes Shopco Stores, Inc. January 1971, the, plan, the firm announced plans to merge with Super Value of Minneapolis. Uh, also, 1971, the new Schwabenon headquarters opened. The merger with SuperValue was completed in April of 1971, just a mere, what, three or four months before my birth. But then the month after I was born, August 1971, they announced their plans to start putting pharmacies in its stores. Uh, and then in 1978, they included putting in optical centers. 1988, a new corporate headquarters was opened by the Bay Park Square Mall in Ashwaubenon, and they expanded to Utah. The company hit $1 billion in sales with 87 stores in 1988. Uh, February of 89, Shopco and Super Value introduced Twin Value uh, in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Uh, and then uh, they combine the general merchandise of Shopco with grocery store selection of Cub Foods. 1990, Shopco opened its 100th store. And then in mid-1991, Shopco became a publicly traded uh, company with a stock that debuted at $15 a share. Um, then, uh, let's see, there's... Uh, there were some other uh, acquisitions uh, around 1999 and 2000. Uh, the Pomida brand was uh, brought in. And then uh, let me find here Sun uh, P Capital Partners, a private equity firm. Uh, they were like a lot of the others. They were gobbling up retail chains left and right. This is how Eddie Lampert got Kmart and Sears. This is how... Bank Capital and some of the other hedge funds got Toys R Us. The hedge funds, oh, this is the newspapers. This is the same time that, uh, uh, was it Digital First Group? Acquired the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Many of you read that. It is owned by a hedge fund. You wonder why the paper is so thin these days compared to its across-the-river rival? It's because the hedge funds are not reinvesting in the paper any more than the hedge funds have reinvested in their stores for Sears, Toys R Us, uh, or Shopco. And that's what they do. Now, Sun Country got its money out. Uh, well, before I tell you how they got acquired here... Um, in the last minute here. Uh, in 2005, they uh, had a bidding war, and Sun Capital Partners won the bidding war at $29 a share, total of $877 million. And at the time, Shopco operated 358 stores under the Shopco Pomida and Shopco Express uh, pharmacy names. They got their money out right away. Uh, they uh, essentially, the, they had two pieces of debt they acquired, one from Okovia Bank and the other one from, uh, from uh, Wells Fargo, and essentially $1.2 billion in debt, and then they ended up selling the real estate, separating that from the retail operations, pocketed $815 million for Sun Capital, but then what happens? The debt still remains on the books. We wonder why Shopco is going down, because they are still trying to pay off the notes that Sun Capital had taken on back in 2005. Now those notes are due. And this is why we're having yet another good retail operation heading into bankruptcy. So what, what can I say? This is the retail trend. It is not necessarily competition to Amazon. It is not necessarily competition to Walmart or Costco. That's, all of that has something to do with it. It's not just the rise of e-commerce. It's the fact that the hedge funds are stripping the equity out of the companies and then leaving the employees hanging once again. But we're out of time. So for Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.